Greetings, welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 30 and I am Beza Rosavi. Today we will uh, study uh, properties of negative feedback and uh, go into some of the details of these properties so that we have a better appreciation for why negative feedback is so popular and so powerful. Uh, but before we go there, let's just uh, review what we covered last time in lecture 29. Well, we uh, uh, listed the properties of feedback without going into too much detail. Uh, we saw in particular four interesting benefits. Uh, one is what we called gain desensitization. And all that means is that the closed loop gain is uh, a, only a weak function of the open loop gain. So anything that affects the open loop gain doesn't affect much the closed loop gain. So the closed loop gain is not very sensitive to changes in A1. For example, due to the temperature or the supply voltage and so forth. Uh, then we also saw uh, the notion of bandwidth extension. As I mentioned, I didn't show it exactly, I mentioned that uh, when we apply feedback around an amplifier, the overall bandwidth of the amplifier increases. So we sacrifice some gain and in return, we have uh, a larger bandwidth. And uh, the third property is that the input and output impedances of this overall feedback circuit are not different from the input and output impedances of the original amplifier that we had bought. So, uh, some interesting things happen and we'll have to see how these modifications come about and how they help us in circuit design. And finally, uh, we also have a higher linearity in this overall circuit than in the original amplifier. And again, we'll have to see why and how. Okay, so let's go over these today uh, in great detail and exactly understand what's going on. So let's start with gain desensitization. Uh, and of course, that's something that is uh, familiar by now very much because we have uh, encountered it a number of times, the desensitization. Okay, so all this means is that if A1 changes due to various factors, and remember, we listed these factors last time, right? We said uh, temperature, supply, what else? Frequency, right? We said frequency of operation. As the frequency of operation changes, the gain of the amplifier changes, right? You bought this amplifier, it has a finite bandwidth. And uh, then uh, we also saw uh, load impedance. We said if you present different impedances to the circuit, the gain of the circuit changes. So if you just have this amplifier and you connect it to a load, the gain may change a lot. But when we put this amplifier in this overall feedback loop and we give it to a load, maybe the gain will not change much. So that's also another factor that affects the gain. So if A1 changes uh, due, due to various factors such as these, the closed loop gain does not change as much, right? So that's why we say the closed loop gain is less sensitive to these factors. Okay, that's all there is to it really as far as gain desensitization is concerned. And what is really interesting is that uh, these other benefits that we have listed here actually fundamentally go back to the gain desensitization concept, right? Because if the gain is not very sensitive to frequency, it means that the bandwidth is larger. So that's this one, right? And uh, we will see later that there are other interesting perspectives here. But that's all we need to say about gain gain desensitization because it's just a direct result of this equation here, right? 
If the loop gain is uh, much greater than 1, uh, then the closed loop gain, this value, is uh, not a very strong function of the open loop gain. Okay, so let's move on to bandwidth extension and see <coughs> how that happens. Uh, now, intuitively we have said that that sh should be expected because if the frequency of operation is a factor that affects the gain of A1, so the gain of A1 is, let's say, 100 at 100 megahertz, but then only 200 at 500 megahertz, right? So the gain of A1 is dropping with frequency. So one of the factors that is affecting the gain is frequency. Now, when we apply feedback around this amplifier, we expect that the overall transfer function has less dependence on A1. So even if A1 drops the frequency, this overall system should not have a gain, should not have much change in gain. So conceptually, this is what I'm thinking, okay? So this is the magnitude of the transfer function, okay? So for the open loop system, we expect something like this, right? It goes and drops like this. There's a, some sort of pole somewhere, and that's what we get. So let's call this the open loop frequency response. So when you bought amplifier A1, that's what we got for amplifier A1. Okay, so now we go and place A1 inside this feedback loop. So, we are sacrificing some gain, right? Okay, so first, at low frequencies, the gain is no, no longer here, the gain is lower. So this is the closed loop system, right? And this would be like Y over X, the magnitude. <clears throat> but our intuition says that we should have a wider bandwidth, meaning that the gain should stay flat for a wider bandwidth, right? So the original gain stayed flat up to this frequency, but now with negative feedback for the overall system, we should expect that the gain remains flat for a wider frequency range. And then of course, eventually it's gonna drop. Now where it drops, we don't know. Does it drop here, does it drop here, etc. But we know that at least it holds steady, holds constant for a wider frequency range. So that's what we are thinking in terms of bandwidth extension. Now let's try to quantify that and see if that's true. Okay, sorry. So here's how we quantify it. As an example, suppose that I model this amplifier that I just bought by just a single pole response. So A1 has a transfer function, okay, the transfer function of this amplifier just by itself, which is like this. It has a low frequency gain and then a single pole, omega P zero. All right, is that good? That's just a model of a single pole system, right? What we see is that when S is zero at very low frequencies, the gain is A zero. So that would be this value here. And then uh, as the frequency goes up, the magnitude begins to drop according to Bode's rule once we reach the pole frequency. Once we reach omega p or omega p zero, it begins to drop, right? So maybe I'll put a zero here just so that these are consistent, okay? All right, so that is the amplifier that we bought. It has one pole and a certain bandwidth, right? So the bandwidth in this case is, uh, is what we have. So the magnitude of A1 as a function of omega starts out at A0 and then begins to fall at omega P0 and we say that the bandwidth is equal to omega P0, right? Okay, so that's the bandwidth of the open loop amplifier. Now I'm curious to see what happens if I place this amplifier in a negative feedback system like this, right? So now I'm interested in uh, the magnitude of Y over X. The response from here to here, not just the response from here to here. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. Can I write the transfer function y over x as a function of s? 
sure. We just follow the same equation, except that this time A1 itself has frequency dependence. So A1 goes up here, A0 over 1 plus S over omega P0. And then we have 1 plus K, A0, 1 plus S over omega P0. All right. Okay. So we need to manipulate this a little bit so that we see some nice results. Uh, let's just uh, multiply everything by 1 plus S over omega P0. So we multiply this out here and get rid of it there. So we have A0, 1 plus K, A0 plus S over omega P0. Right? Okay, and uh, let's go ahead and again manipulate a little more. We're going to divide the numerator and the denominator by 1 plus the loop gain. So here we have A0 over 1 plus KA0. And then in the denominator, we have 1 over S over 1 plus KA0 times omega P. Okay, so let's look at this result carefully and see what it tells us. All right, well, well when S is zero at a very low frequencies, what do we see here? Is it expected? So let's go to black here. Okay, so if S is zero, we see that Y over X is just A zero over one plus K A zero. Of course, right? That's what we've seen all along. That yes, due to negative feedback, the gain drops from the original open loop gain to that open loop gain divided by 1 plus Ka, 1 plus the loop gain. So that's right here. That would be right here, right? So if this value is A0, so let me try to superimpose these again. I have to use, go back to my colors to make sure everything is consistent. So here's what we have. So for A1, we have this response, right? So this is the magnitude of A1, starts at A0, and the pole is at omega P0. Now, for the closed loop system, I noticed that at low frequencies, the gain is not A0, it's dropped, right? Of course, because we apply negative feedback. So the gain is over here, it's given by A0, 1 plus KA0. Okay, all right. Okay, so that's the low frequency value. Now, for this new system, how many poles do we have? We still have one pole, right? Because the denominator is still of first order. How much is the pole frequency? Well, the closed loop pole, so closed <coughs> loop pole is so I uh, need to carry this omega p0 around. Okay, so we see that I have to set this to zero. So we see that omega uh, is equal to um, omega p0 times 1 plus k a0. If you want to have a negative sign, that's okay. Of course, we remember how this works. So the closed loop pole is this much, right? Where is that? Well, that's way out here, right? That would be omega P0 times 1 plus KA0. Remember, KA0 is usually pretty large, right? 5, 10, maybe higher. So this new pole frequency is pretty high, quite higher than the original open loop pole frequency. Okay, so if I look at this transfer function, it has some constant value up here, as one here, a pole frequency here. And Bodhi says, you start at low frequencies over here. We continue. Once we reach the pole frequency, the slope begins to changes to minus 20 degree per decade. So we have to continue to reach this pole, right? And at that pole, the slope will change. So interestingly, this will actually happen right on top of the original response. So 
the bandwidth now has increased to this much. Okay, so let's make sure that uh, we are not missing the forest because of the trees, right? <clears throat> so we applied feedback around an amplifier that we bought. We bought this amplifier and it has some bandwidth, right? The bandwidth was this much. And it had some gain. The gain was this much. And then we placed it in a feedback loop. And we sacrificed some gain. So the gain dropped by a factor of 1 plus the loop gain. Right? So the gain was, used to be uh, 500, now it's 20. But the bandwidth increased. The bandwidth went from this much to this much. Right? So we uh, traded gain for bandwidth in this process. Okay, so this is the meaning of what we call bandwidth extension. And uh, this notion is extremely powerful. We use it in many different designs to increase the bandwidth of a system by virtue of negative feedback. Very well, let's uh, carry on to the uh, third property, which is modification of input and output impedances. Uh, so for that, I have to go to the next slide because I need more room. So let's talk about that. So the third property is modification of input and output impedances. All right, so this is something that we will discuss uh, extensively later when we go into a particular feedback circuits. But here, I just want to give you some intuitive understanding of why something like this could happen. Why is it that the closed loop output impedance, for example, is not the same as the open loop output impedance? All right, so let's try to understand that. Okay, so, so I'm going to write here without feedback and then right here with feedback and of course we always mean negative feedback in this course when we say feedback all right okay so i have bought this amplifier and it has a certain voltage gain which we know how much it is, right? Can I model this amplifier by a 7 and equivalent? Sure. So we find the voltage out here, which is minus GM times RC times V in. That becomes our 7 and voltage. And then we need the output resistance of the circuit to model the 7 and resistance. To find the output resistance, we place a small signal voltage out here. We measure the current while the input is set to zero. And that would be RC if we neglect the early effect. All right, so the output resistance R out is equal to RC. Okay, so this is the seven equivalent of that, right? That's very easy. All right, so let's uh, draw a red box around this and say, these two are the same thing. Okay, so now if I come along and add a load resistance to the circuit, so let's say the circuit has to drive a load, right? RL. Then I know that the gain drops, right? Because uh, the gain is given by minus GM times the parallel combination of these two. And the Thevenin system also, we see that, right? In the Thevenin system, RL is going here. So obviously, uh, now we have voltage attenuation. So the voltage that we get here is less than when we didn't have RL. So it's the same issue here, right? So we see that uh, the gain of the circuit is sensitive to the load impedance. All right? Okay. And uh, for example, just... Uh, to have some numbers to work with, let's say this is one kilo ohm. So this is one kilo ohm. And we see that if RL 
is one kilo ohm, then the gain drops by a factor of two. That's clear, right? So without RL, the gain is minus GM times one kilo ohm. Now that we have another one kilo ohm, these two go in parallel, the load resistance drops, or this attenuation is a factor of two, so we have a factor of two reduction gain. All right, okay. So that means that uh, the output voltage swing uh, drops by a factor of two. All right, so let's say I was trying to generate 20 millivolts peak to peak, and it was fine, but as soon as I connect this to, to here, and this is one kilo ohm, that voltage swing becomes 10 millivolts peak to peak instead of 20 millivolts peak to peak, right? So the output swing has dropped. All right, so now let's take this amplifier and uh, place it inside a negative feedback system. So uh, here's conceptually what we have. We have that amplifier inside here, right? And then we have some K, we have our subtractor, and so forth, and uh, we have an X here and a Y here. Okay. All right, so um, I can still go ahead and load this circuit with the resistor, right? So I can apply RL here. Okay, so let's see what happens. So let's assume that the original voltage gain that we had here, so AV is minus 50 without load and uh, minus 25 with RL equals one kilo ohm. Right? That's but as an example. Okay. Now let's suppose here that with, uh, with no RL, so without RL, AV is equal to, uh, let's say I picked K to be 0.1, so it's 50 over 1 plus 5, 50 over 6 is 8.33. 8.33. All right. Okay, so we know that, right? We saw that last time. Now, if I add RL, what happens? With RL equals one kilo ohm. Well, this amplifier sees a load of one kilo ohm. says, oh, my gain has dropped from minus 50 to minus 25, right? So then AV comes out to be 25 over 1 plus 0.1 times 25, 2.5, right? So that's 25 over 3.5, and that's about uh, 7 something, right? So approximately 7, maybe 7.2. Okay, so these are things that we have expected so far, right? But let's uh, take a new perspective. What happened here? When I didn't have feedback and I connected the load, the voltage gain dropped by a factor of two. When I had feedback and I connected the same load, the voltage gain dropped by only maybe 15%, 20%, right? So that means that this circuit is less sensitive to this load impedance than this circuit is. All right, so let's go ahead and construct the Thevenin equivalent of this whole thing, just the way we did it for the open loop circuit. What does it look like? Mm -hmm. All right, so here we go. The Thevenin voltage, we have a Thevenin voltage, which is uh, uh, something like A1 over 1 plus KA1 times X, right? And then we have a resistance 
and then we have that load so let's add the load in a different color like before so here's our load so I want you to very carefully compare this scenario with this scenario all right so what can we say about this R out this R out just very generally speaking what can we say about it so here's what happened in this case when I connected one kilo ohm, the gain dropped by a factor of two so my conclusion was that this is also one kilo ohm, which was true in this case when I connect one kilo ohm, the gain does not drop by a factor of two it drops by maybe 15 percent so what can I say about R out R out is definitely less than one kilo ohm, right so this has to be less than one kilo ohm. so you can see that without RL we have a gain of 8.3 for the closed loop system with RL you have a gain of 7.2 so the gain did not the voltage swing here this voltage that we have for example whatever 20 millivolts uh, the voltage swing did, did not drop by a factor of 2 when I added the load so that tells me that this output resistance has to be less than one kilowatt. So this means that the output resistance of this circuit, so if you look from here, R out, R out two, and you compare with this circuit, R out one, right? The key point here is that R out two is less than R out one okay that's all we want to get out of this example right we will quantify these much more carefully later but it's just so that we have a fundamental intuitive understanding of what happened so in summary as a result of negative feedback we see that the circuits gain is less sensitive to this load right it goes from 8.33 to 7.2 and if I look at the 7 and equivalent, what this means is that the output impedance of the closed loop circuit has to be less than the output impedance of the open loop circuit for this to happen. Here the gain dropped by a factor of 2. Because these two are equal, here the gain drops by less than a factor of 2. So this has to be less than 1 kilo. All right? Okay, very good. So that was the property of... Uh, modification of input and output impedances uh, let's go to the next property namely higher linearity so uh, let's talk about that all right so I want to show you why negative feedback improves the linearity and what does it mean anyway well, remember the differential pair and its hyperbolic tangent characteristic? Okay, so the bipolar differential pair looks like this, right? And we had V in 1 and V in 2, and then X and Y. And uh, what we saw was that Vx minus Vy as a function of v in 1 minus v in 2 the differential characteristic of the circuit was a hyperbolic tangent so it was like this and we said well this is not linear right because here is roughly a straight line but then it gradually departs from a straight line uh, we also gave it another perspective we said this is not linear because the slope of the characteristic is not constant here we have some slope, right? Here we have some slope. Here we have a different slope, right? So that means that the circuit is nonlinear. Okay, so this is the characteristic of a differential pair that I have bought. Now I'm going to immerse this differential pair in a big negative feedback loop. And I'm wondering what happens to this characteristic. Okay, all right, so we can easily quantify that. All right, so uh, uh, the only thing that is a little confusing is, is that I have X and Y here and X and Y here. So let me change these names to something else. 
so that we can avoid that problem. So let's erase these and we go back and call this for example A and B and then this would be VA minus VB. Alright, so now I, I'm going to take this whole thing which is A1, that my amplifier, right? And this amplifier. And then I will put it in a negative feedback system. So this is X and this is Y with a feedback factor of K. So this new circuit now has some sort of characteristic, right? And I would like to see how that compares with this in terms of nonlinearity in terms of this behavior, this slope change that we see, this saturation effect that we see. Okay, well, uh, maybe what I can do is uh, just go by some examples. Let's say that we have a gain out here, so A is equal to uh, 100. And let's say the gain around here a1 is 50. Of course, there's a negative sign. I'm not worried about the negative sign. Is that okay? So the circuit is nonlinear, the differential pair itself. And what we know is that its gain is about 100 here, and it's about 50 here, when the input difference is around this value. Now, when I place this amplifier inside a negative feedback system with sub k, so again, let's just say k is 0.1. I would like to see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to change the colors and uh, I will call this something new. So, what does A1 translate to for the closed loop gain? So, closed loop gain comes out to be A1 over 1 plus Ka1, right? So A1 is 100 uh, divided by 11. 100 divided by 11, this is about 0.91. Okay, all right. Uh, how about here? How much closed loop gain do I have in this case? So again, closed loop gain, is equal to A1 over 1 plus Ka1. In this case, A1 has dropped to 50. So 50, 1 plus uh, 5. So that's uh, 50 over 6, which is about 8.33. OK. So what's interesting is that the original open loop amplifier had so much gain variation from here to here for this voltage range, right? The gain dropped from 100 to 50. But the closed loop system now has much less gain variation. So meaning this whole thing, if you, the input is this X here and the output is this Y here, has only this much gain variation, about 10%. So if I try to superimpose this result upon that result, the closed loop, uh, characteristic will look like this, right? The gain is smaller, right? The, this gain is 100, this gain is like 9, point no, uh, sorry, 9, this is 9.1, this gain is about 9.1, but it's, uh, it has less variation in it, so it's a more linear circuit. So it goes like this for a wider frequency range before it begins to experience saturation effects, right? So that's what we call higher linearity, meaning that the characteristic is linear across a wider range of input voltages, right? So here we are more linear from here to here because if you think about it, the gain is 9.1 here, 8.33 here. It hasn't changed much, so it's almost like a straight line. So it has to go on for a while before it experiences this type of saturation and so on. All right, so that's what we mean by higher linearity. Okay, so this is a summary 
of the nice properties of negative feedback. And of course, as we analyze specific circuits in the future, we will encounter these again and again. We will see that the gain has changed, the input and output impedances have changed, and so on. All right, the last topic today is to build some foundation for the actual analysis that we want to do later for specific feedback circuits. This foundation is just sort of uh, circuit theory, what is basic circuit theory that you have seen be before, but we just have to formalize it and make sure that you remember all of that before we jump into analysis. Okay, so we're going to talk about prerequisites for analysis of feedback circuits. <clears throat> Okay, so first a few quick notes. <clears throat> a few quick notes. So these look trivial, but we have to build upon them one by one. So, uh, A. Ideal versus real sources. So let me make a table here. I will say ideal, and I say real. And here we have a voltage source. And here we have a current source. What does an ideal voltage source look like? Well, it's a voltage source and its output impedance is zero, exactly zero, right? So that's, that would be like this. It can be a constant voltage source, it can be a variable voltage source, it can be a dependent voltage source, it can be an independent voltage source. Whatever it is, its output impedance is zero. All right, okay. So, uh, how about the real voltage source? Well, the real voltage source never has an output impedance of zero because if this were zero, it would mean that I could connect the resistor from here to here and make that resistor very, very, very small so that I get a lot of current, right? Yeah, uh, infinite current eventually. But uh, that's not true. So here's a, an example of voltage source, this battery, right? This battery is a voltage source, but can I get infinite current from here to here? if I place a short circuit? No, because internally it has some resistance. So it has an output resistance. In physics you might have called it, called it internal resistance. So we model that by something like this. Okay, so now if I place a short circuit here, the current that flows is not infinite. Right? Now, how much should R out be? Well, if this is a good voltage source, R out should be small. Right? Uh, now, again, what does it mean, small? How do we quantify that? That's okay. At this point, we don't worry about that. How about a current source? What's an ideal current source? An ideal current source is one that delivers the same current regardless of any load that we connect to it. Right? So an ideal current source looks like this. And it always wants to deliver this much current. So whether we place a short circuit here, whether we connect a 1 mega ohm resistor, 10 mega ohm resistor, 100 mega ohm resistor, it always wants to deliver this much current. All right? OK. So how about a real current source? A real current source wants to deliver that current, but it has an internal resistance. So if we leave it open, it does not give us infinite voltage. Here, if this is left open, meaning there's no resistance between these two, and this current is multiplied by infinity, it gives us infinite voltage. And of course, the real current source cannot do that. So to make sure that we don't get infinite voltage, 
we model that by a resistance like this, R out. So now, even though this might be left open, not connected to anything, the voltage that we generate here is not infinity. Okay? So, you do need to think about why this is in series and this is in parallel. So I invite you to try the other way around, try to place this in parallel and this in series, and see that the result doesn't make a whole lot of sense. It doesn't really do what we want it to do. It doesn't model the real situation, so that's why this has to be in series and this has to be in parallel. Okay, so this is basic stuff. Now, the next basic com uh, idea is this. How do we measure a voltage or a current? Okay, well, here's a little amplifier that I have built. And I would like to measure this output voltage. What do I do? Well, I take a voltmeter, a multimeter, right? I connect it to here. So here's a voltmeter. And the voltmeter measures this voltage, either AC signal or DC, whatever you want, and gives us the information. So that's not that hard, right? Okay. But what should be the impedance of this voltmeter in the ideal case? So this impedance, right? How much should this be? Well, I'm expecting that the voltmeter measure this voltage without bothering the circuit, without disturbing or loading the circuit, right? Without changing the gain of the circuit. How is that possible? That's possible only if this impedance, the impedance of this voltmeter, is infinite, right? So the circuit doesn't feel that we connected something between these two points. So this should be infinite impedance. So an ideal voltmeter has an infinite impedance. So any device or circuit that is supposed to measure a voltage has to have an infinite input impedance. That's the key point here. Okay, so any device or circuit that measures voltage must have a high impedance. Okay? High, of course, infinity would be good, but in practice, it should be just high. Okay, that's for measuring the voltage. So we have some voltage here, and that's how we did it. How about the current quantity? So let's suppose that I have the same circuit like this. And someone says, you know, I need to measure the current that flows through the transistor, like the small signal current. Why? Well, we don't know, but he or she wants that wants mm -hmm. to, to measure the current. How do I measure the current through this wire? Well, I really have to do this. I have to break this wire. So use ground. I have to break this wire and insert in here a current meter, right? So this is a current meter. Or we call it ammeter. Current meter. So the current passes through the current meter and it tells us how much, right? How much small signal current we have. All right, so now, what should the impedance of this current meter be? Again, we don't want to disturb the circuit by inserting this current meter into the circuit. So, that means that the impedance of this current meter from here to here should be zero, ideally so that this circuit doesn't feel it. It just, it just looks like that old circuit, right? It thinks that the emitter is connected to ground. So, uh, the impedance should be zero, or at least low, right? Low. 
So any device or any circuit that wants to measure a current or sense a current has to have a low impedance. Any device that wants to measure or sense a voltage has to have a high impedance. These are the key points that will help us in the future. All right, so now that we have uh, gone over these basic concepts, in the next lecture we will begin to uh, see how we will go about analyzing feedback circuits. As you can see, the subject is pretty complex, so we have to build up slowly, starting from basic concepts and step by step, improve our understanding and our skills for analyzing the circuits. I will see you next